Hey, hey there. Happy Monday to everybody. Listen, I am sending out lots of joy and all things good as we head into this holiday season. I am Sadia Davis, the director for the Center for Creative Entrepreneurship. And just literally weeks ago, we decided to launch a nine day streamathon. What was I thinking? Straight days in a row, honoring nine sectors of the creative sector, of which the Center for Creative Entrepreneurship provides resources, relationships, skills, and in some cases, we direct funding, right? Uh, in order to help creative entrepreneurs establish a sustainable business in a creative sector. So that's music, film, TV, video, gosh. Tonight, we're focused on sports. And of all of the industries, I have to say, as much as I love working and like, not working, but um, watching sports, in terms of the industry of business in sports is the one sector that I find to be the most challenging because people can go anywhere. Um, they can create any sort of business after either being a professional player or deciding to create a gamification. Um, you know, that's a big thing now with esports. I'm wearing this Rolex hat tonight because if you're from Chicago and you know we have some competitive ball clubs, whether it's the Cubs or the Sox, right? You cannot wear a Cubs hat at a Sox game, right? So if you're from here, if you've ever been to a game, you've got to go neutral. You've got to wear a Black Hawks jersey if you're going to a Sox or a Cubs game and you're not one of the two. So I decided tonight, having uh, opened the Rolex boutique here on Michigan Avenue in 2011 and understanding the value of Rolex and how as a sponsor, they really only sponsor particular sports, that which shows the achievement of one individual. And in fact, they do sponsor tennis. So I wore this hat tonight in honor of our first sports guest, um, but we'll get there in just a moment. In the meantime, I wanna tell you guys a couple of things. As we go through, only two more nights to go. Um, visual artist Tony Fitzpatrick, who's a Chicago legend and a dramatic actor, has given us four beautiful puzzles of his incredible work to be auctioned off, which we will do on our final night. And also thank you to Tony Vitali, who is allowing us to raffle off a vertical groove. Let's take a look. cool you can literally customize who you give that vertical grooves floating record player to so let it not be a lonely lonely time this holiday season go ahead and meet, be sure to get your tickets for our final night which is film and we will raffle off for any ticket over 250 and up that's a 450 dollar record player i'm just letting you know it's fabulous it's amazing it's art it's design and it sounds great so Sign on to the Center for Creative Entrepreneurship website at CCE Global and get your tickets soon. Um, with all that being said, before we get started with our sports event tonight, much like we 
do when we're at a sports event, we hear the national anthem. Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming. And the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave for the land of the free and the Jim Corneliuson has been the national anthem singer for the Chicago Blackhawks since the 2008-9 hockey season. His renown has risen along with the Blackhawks' emergence as a powerhouse in the National Hockey League, including Stanley Cup victories in 2010, 2013, and 2015. His unique yet traditional rendition of the Star Spangled Banner has most recently led him to being asked back to the Indianapolis 500 in 2018 to repeat his performance of Back Home Again in Indiana. And at his direction, he has asked for me not to read all of this, but I will say that he has appeared on NPR Morning Edition, The Today Show, The Wall Street Journal, Sports Illustrated, The Boston Globe, The Los Angeles Times, The Washington Post, and The Chicago Tribune, and many others. Other performances include The Colbert Report, 2012, Ryder Cup, 2009, that was amazing, by the way. Oh my gosh, he has been a part of Division I universities, the Chicago Bulls, White Sox, Cubs, and Fire, and a performance of the anthem in a killer concert with the Smashing Pumpkins. Jim, <laughs> you know, I'm saying. Hi, Nadia, how are you? I mean, oh, I've still got my glasses on. <laughs> I'm great, I'm great. You know, I'm, 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 not wearing your hat tonight because I need to actually form it. Um, but one of the reasons I wanted to bring you on tonight is because you have a unique story, Jim. And, and just briefly, I would love for you to share a, a little bit about you. And here's why. You sing one song. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you have a history of being an opera singer. Mm-hmm. And to be able to go from that and to launch yourself into a business in the sports industry, I think it's really captivating. So share a little bit about who you are, not the bullets that I just read. <laughs> well, some of it is uh, some of it are, are my actions and some of it is uh, some of it's sports launching me. Um, but I did my master's in opera performance at Indiana University and then uh, was invited to Chicago by the Lyric Opera of Chicago in 1995 and uh, was managed by Columbia Artists after two years in the apprentice program there and, and sang um, throughout uh, the United States and, uh, and numerous places in, in Europe as well. So that was kind of my, my background as a, a professional singer. And, and during that time, when, uh, shortly after I came to the Lyric, uh, I started doing a few anthems every year for the Blackhawks. And that was really um, uh, a lot of fun, but it was also like, you know, free tickets, free parking, some free food, 
um, free beers from the fans and I think 50 bucks, something like that. So uh, it was just something that I did uh, for fun as I was uh, as I was doing opera. So uh, in 08, 09, the Blackhawks asked me to do all the anthems. And uh, uh, at that time, I was going through a divorce. I knew I wouldn't be traveling. And I thought, what the heck, you know, I'll, I'll give it a shot. And then uh, we went to the Western Conference Finals in 09. Also, they had the very first uh, Winter Classic on January 1 of 09, which was internationally broadcast hockey game outdoors at Wrigley Field. So I was able to sing that. And then the next year, we won the uh, the, the Super Bowl. Uh, so, it, it uh, excuse me, the Super Bowl. I'm sitting here thinking, I'm thinking of Jason. Oh be on here in a minute. Uh, uh, we worked with Stanley Cup in 2010, yep. and uh, you know that that did an awful lot then to changing. I'd been doing real estate as uh, kind of a, a, I guess it was a transition after getting out of opera, and uh, shortly after winning that Stanley Cup, that we had the Bears playoffs in January of 11. So six months later, those were huge. Uh, I sang both of those, and uh, and then I just back to singing. But now it was one song. So it was, you know, opera, you're singing the great composers of history, uh, that music, and, and uh, it's a very different thing than going into sports and you, and you start singing one, one song. Right. So uh, that's the part of, uh, you know, the success of the Blackhawks, the success, success of the Bears, that really um, uh, propelled me into the limelight. But then people started to attach to the anthem well beyond just the Blackhawks, and that's been uh, quite a journey. Mm. Where's taking me? Well, you know, I tell you, I've met you because you, if I may share, 2112 Chicago, of course, mm -hmm. the largest creative co working space and creative incubator in the world. And one of the things that happens there are random, it's the theory of random collisions, right? Where individuals right. intersect with people they might not ever meet. Um, and in this case, you know, you happen to sit in that space on some occasions. Um, and that's how you and I met. Um, also, briefly, I, I would love for you, I believe, is it okay to share that you're writing something? Yeah, sure, sure. You're writing a book. Tell yeah, I'm writing, I'm writing a book, which um, really is uh, about relating my my story um, since being the anthem singer for the Chicago Blackhawks kind of it's not a bi it's not autobiographical it's more a, I want people to understand what I have come to know and uh, uh, being the anthem singer with the Blackhawks and um, doing work that I do with veterans the people who come up to me and ask me to be a part of the events or share what's going on in their lives um, I, I've had my life's been enriched very much by the people who who come to me and identify uh, the national anthem with me, and then and then experiences in their life that um, that they attach to me. So uh, I share some of those stories, and I've done like 15 interviews with some pretty amazing people that I also uh, well, I've had the privilege to come to know them, and they they trust me enough to do this this book in this more or less volatile environment uh, regarding anything political these days. And uh, so it's been a, it's been a great. Uh, it's been a great, a great experience. Oh, good. Well, I would love to encourage individuals to stick by you. Um, we've shown how to reach out and be connected with you because when that book launches, I think it's going to be pretty powerful and pretty impactful from what I understand. And um, well, we'll see, you know, you can't, uh, one of the things I've learned as a singer forever, right? You go out and you do what you do. Yeah. And then you see how people respond. And, uh, you know, some people it will respond positively. Others will not really give a damn. And that's just life in the, uh, in the arts, I think. You put yourself out there and, and you, you, you see, you know, what, what comes of it. And, uh, and regardless, you move on to, to the next thing anyway. And uh, always try to put your best foot forward and see where it goes. Yeah, well, you've put your best foot forward, and I have to commend you on that. And speaking of, before we let you go, I want to encourage our creative entrepreneurs to understand something very unique. Um, and that is, is that you, as an individual, are your business, meaning you have merchandise, right? Um, right. And that's important because as individuals consider what does it mean to become an entrepreneur in a particular industry, you know, it, it's so unique what you've done in a sense, monetizing um, the song, the, not necessarily the song, but the performance of it, the bobbleheads, right? All of the things that, 
you know, individuals connect to you on a very visceral level. And I'm really excited that you're your book will start to share a light of how that song impacts individuals when they hear it. There's been a lot of controversy, obviously, um, uh, in the last couple of years. Um, but the reality is, is that we still use that song every time we start a sports event. And um, yeah, it's a uh, it's an amazing song, honestly. I mean, people don't understand it. But you only you only know what you know. And uh and again, if I am able to share what I can share from from 12 years ago, the uh, the reality of the anthem, the fact that it's actually rooted in American history in a real situation, and the themes that run the, that run through it, um, it's it's amazing how it resonates with certain people. Uh, one of the chapters I call two worlds, and it's essentially that you have 90% of the people at a, a sporting event who are there, you know, enjoying the out the outdoors. They're there with family and friends. It's a bright, sunny day, say. The, this particular chapter is written around an event at Wrigley Field. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, you know, people are having beers, they're having a good time. But then at the same time, somebody would come up to me and they start telling me, you know, how they start telling me about their son who's been hit in the, in the head with a rocket while on patrol in Iraq and they start weeping. And so, I, you know, there I, I'm, I'm hugging this mom in the middle of uh, Wrigley Field while people are still coming up and, and, and asking me for selfies or patting me on the back or <clears throat> go Hawks, way to go, Jim. You know, you, you have these two worlds that happen all of a sudden. And uh, and I run into that <clears throat> over and over again at Blackhawk games, at, at uh, baseball games or whatever. And it really, um, it, it changes my experience of those live sporting events. Uh, yeah. I think from, and, and for whatever, it's, it's, uh, it's very deep. The hats, by the way, and the bobbleheads, all of that, right? That was all part of just kind of like trying to develop a brand, try to increase the the, okay. the brand ability, you know, what I do. I do the anthem a certain way. I do it the exact same way every time. It's my Big Mac. It's taken me to, you know, well, it's ultimately ended up with the invitations to sing back home again in Indiana for the Indianapolis 500. But uh, the, the Ryder Cup, the 100th anniversary of the NFL's uh, uh, opening game uh division one stuff in kansas and university of nebraska omaha which by the way had number one hockey team a couple of years ago in the uh, division one who yeah. who's heard of New university of nebraska omaha but well there you go um, it, it's really it's a beautiful demonstration of taking an idea and executing it into a business and really um you know furthering that with explaining right. in the book that we look forward to. And I hope you choose my title. But anyways, thank you so much, Jim, for um, starting us off like we start off all of our sports events. You bet. Uh, the National Anthem. I really appreciate you. <laughs> Thanks, Saudi. Appreciate <laughs> So with that, you know, let's definitely talk to Mr. Murray, who is taking his time to be with us tonight. Kamal Murray is the founder of the Excess Tennis and Education Foundation. As a graduate of the, of the Chicago Public Schools, Kamal knows firsthand how athletic prog programs and crucial are crucial to Chicago's youth during the most critical stages in their life. Kamal participated in Chicago Park District tennis programs as a child and subsequently was awarded a tennis scholarship to Florida A&M University where he received a full scholarship earning a BA and MBA. Kamal Murray began offering tennis coaching to five children in 2004. As the need for a program of its type became increasingly evident, Excess Tennis was founded in 2008. The organization's success has been remarkable. Murray's initial five students have gone on to win national championships, IHSA state championships, two junior Olympic gold medals. In 2017, he brought 40 inner city youth, not only got a chance to attend the U.S. Open, they got a chance to witness Kamal coaching Sloane Stevens to her historic 2017 U.S. Open title and see their South Side coach become only the third African-American coach to win a Grand Slam in its 95th year history. 
In 2014, Kamau walked into City Hall with an idea to build a world-class tennis facility on the South Side. The new $15 million excess tennis village is only the third facility to ever be built in a low-income census track area and is opening, and it did. The thing is, it's open. My God, it's open. It's open and you need to see it and you need to be, get down there and discover. It has also bid, won the bid for the International Lever Cup in 2018. Kamal Murray. Hello, how's it going? I mean, it's going well. I mean, you know, I have to read all of that because it's not enough to just say who you are and what you do. Like so many things in that bio matter. But at the same time, you know, you're you. So, <laughs> I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. It's always a good thing, Coach. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing great. Doing great. Sitting I in a hotel room in LA trying not to catch coronavirus. Murray, I tell you, trying to keep up with you is, um, it's amazing. You'll be at the French Open. One time you were like, you want to come? And I was like, oh, I could do I, Do I have money to come? I mean, like, how does, how does one say yes and just jump on a plane and go, right? Um, we met through a, a wonderful mutual friend, Les Coney, who introduced us a couple of years back. And one of the things that I found fascinating is when I toured your facility down on the South Side before it became its current iteration, it blew my mind. Yeah, it's, it's been good. I mean, it's been, um, you know, I think that tennis courts uh, require a lot of real estate. Um, so one tennis court is bigger than a standard Chicago city lot. Um, so I think that um from a sheer scale a sheer scale standpoint i think it's always a little bit startling uh to sort of see you know at what time you, at the time you talked about was only five indoor courts and still was like forty thousand square feet um but then you know you, you boil it down to two to four people on the court and then it it, it it's sort of sums it up a little bit and brings it down a little bit to where uh, a level that's a little bit more absorbable and manageable yeah. So with the current location, um, how many courts? Because I know there's like a red clay court. Talk to us a little bit about that, because, you know, individuals know your history with Sloan and we can talk more about that and we'll share some pictures. But what you've created for the city of Chicago is remarkable and it's a beautiful story behind it. Yeah. So we've got 15 indoor courts. We've got a 10,000 square foot gymnasium uh, and we also have uh, four classrooms, which, and two individual study rooms, which I think is even more important than the tennis courts. Uh, we've also got 15 outdoor courts. So it's really a place where a kid could come every day, uh, and do get their homework done. Um, we've got, you know, computers and desks and tutors available, uh, Monday through Thursday. And then we got a gym with treadmills and weights and all the stuff that, you know, a kid, a, a budding athlete should have access to, but probably not old enough to belong to an LA fitness or something like that. And then we got 12 tennis courts. And so it's, uh, you know, we we were starting to gain a lot of traction, service a lot of kids. So we need to build a space that could service enough people between the hours of four and seven uh, when the kids, you know, needed these types of services most. Um, our five courts in our old facility was just not enough. It only allowed us to serve 20, 22 kids at a time. And now we can, um, you know, do 48 kids uh, or pre-COVID, right? 48 yeah, yeah. kids at one time. So uh, it allows us to have a lot of impact um, on a daily basis. And I think that's what we really wanted to do. Uh, in a city like Chicago, if you don't have a roof, you have a summer camp, right? Because it's cold eight to nine months out of the year. So wanted to make sure that we were able to like be a true academy and provide, you know, sort of, uh, consistent service to the kids. Um, you know, I also say that tennis is one of the best sports um, and one of the biggest opportunities for those who love to coach and love to impact kids. You know, tennis is one-on-one, -on -one, right? Mm -hmm. So you get football and, and basketball and that's a lot of team. But if you want to develop an individual relationship with a kid, tennis is like one of the best ways because it's a lot of one-on-one -on -one, um, and truly like the best way to develop a, a lifelong relationship. I mean, I have relationships with young people that are 25, 26 years old. Uh, and by the time they left me at 18, we probably spent 
10,000 hours on the court together. Okay, so you don't look older than like 28, 30 already. Oh, uh, I just turned 40, October 4th. That's <laughs> like, okay, happy all, birthday. I can't see here. You know? No, we don't need to know about all the details because you look <laughs> yeah. great. You just, congratulations, Kamal, 40? Yeah, I feel it too. I feel it in my bones. When that oh. cold comes in Chicago, I start to slow down. <laughs> well, I hear you and I say, well, at least while you're in a little bit of a warmer client, cl you know, like climate, you know, hang in there. I'm really excited to hear. Okay, so this is funny. Um, I'm, I'm excited that there are classrooms. You know, I'm huge on education and I love that you're providing that space um, to keep that part of the connection going. I haven't toured yet because I've been um, very adamant about making sure you were there <laughs> and you travel all over. So I, I've missed my opportunity on multiple occasions. I know where it is I'm off of Garfield. You know, I know exactly I've toured and drove and then I'm like, nope, I'm not going in until you're in town. So yeah. I will hold on to that, <laughs> but right, I have to share, I won't go too deep, but I definitely want to share one individual and in spotlight Bob Arthur, um, because he's an individual that um, with, you know, Magellan company, speaking of sports, did a really good job of making contributions to the Blackhawks, to the Sox, to um, I think the Cubs, right? And also making sure that there was some funding for you with excess tennis, if I may. Yeah, Bob is, you know, one of Chicago's angels. Um, you know, he's a true fan of sports, uh, a giver of, um, you know, to a lot of youth causes, but also somebody that truly invests, right? You know, it's like Bob is the kind of guy that'll provide funding for your organization the first time. And then you feel guilty taking his money after that because you become such friends with him and Susan. Yes. And it goes beyond like a donor and donee type of relationship. Um, and so, you know, you, you get so close to him, you understand how, how good of a great of a person he is. You feel guilty, like, you know, asking him for money. It's like now I feel so terrible, like, you know, asking him for funding and I almost don't want his money because I'd rather have his friendship instead. So yes. that's, that's sort of the kind of guy he is. And like me, him, my wife, we go out to dinner all the time. Yeah. Uh, and it's not about, you know, even managing a donor relationship. It's about, you know, like just spending time with a friend, you know, yes. As a matter of fact, the last dinner that I had, uh, in March before the shutdown of Chicago was with Bob and Susan. Um, and Susan loves tennis. Yeah, Susan loves tennis. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I, I had to shine that light because, um, you know, shortly before he and I had our meeting or whatever, um, he was coming to meet with you. And we, he was like, Do you know Kamal? And I was like, Absolutely. You know, and it was just one of those things where I just felt like, wow, you know, good person, solid individual. And if you don't know, you would never know, right? Because such a humble human being. And I just wanted to just out of my heart, shine a light there um, because so many industries have, have shifted with COVID. Um, speaking of which, how's it going at Excess Tennis right now? Um, it, it's, you know, it's going. I think that tennis is socially distant. Mm -hmm. And so- it you is know, one I mean, of those sports when you look at like the CDC's sort of risk level, tennis yeah. is like at the lowest risk. And so we've actually seen a lot of people who normally will be playing basketball or soccer or baseball not be able to play those sports and sort of just give tennis a try. You know, so we yeah. we, we know deep down that like young black boys from the south side don't want to play tennis. But for now, we are enjoying like the uptick in our program primarily. Uh, you know, due to an increase in young black uh, boys trying out tennis. So we are still operating and, you know, we've obviously just reduced the density of the kids in each class, but we are, you know, still rolling, you know. So now yeah. we've got two kids on a court and we're still offering private instruction. Um, we've eliminated guest policies, but we, you know, we are still, you know, going strong. And we've got 36 employees that are still able to work of the 36 employees, 30 have triple minimum wage jobs. So our employees are still able to make a living. Um, and so we, you know, we've, we've done all right. Our membership has actually increased by 
200 people since COVID. So we were able to, because of the outdoor courts, we were able to have a full summer camp where we had almost over 100 kids. Uh, obviously not at the same time, but, you know, sort of rotating through. So we were still able to provide a service to the community and a safe haven uh, to kids who had been cooped up in the house uh, and whose parents have to go to work. I mean, the space that we work in, the neighborhood we work in, uh, have people that, you know, work in retail or, or don't have the ability to work from home. And so us being able to be open and provide a place to just drop your kid off was extremely important. Um, and the community sort of really, really appreciated it. Yeah, you know, I'm glad you mentioned that because when you think about you got one person on one side of the court and one person on the other, you can't get any more socially distanced than that. Yeah, it's two people per 7,700 square feet. So we're well in compliance. Yeah, and then you've got these vaulted high ceilings, I already know. Yeah. So <laughs> let's take a look at some of your photos. Now, the first photo you shared with us, talk to us a little bit about that one. Uh, yeah, so that was 2017, actually. That was uh, the year Sloan won the U.S. Open. Um, and, you know, you get there early to just practice on the different outer courts. What's funny is, you know, at the time, Sloan had just came back from an injury, and she was ranked like 900 in the world. So we didn't play a single match until um, the quarterfinals on Arthur Ashe Stadium. We were playing on outer courts. You know, they were, you know, putting us in the backyard. Um, and then, you know, so that's a picture of a temporary Louis Armstrong court, which we played our first five matches on. And it's just, you know, making last minute tweaks, yeah. uh, you know, to your player just to kind of get it right. And, you know, every girl, right, their nerves show up in their serve. So what? you practice to serve the most of anything. So that's just trying to help gain some confidence and some last minute adjustments. Yeah, well, we're going to show, we're just going to kind of flip through a couple of photos here that, you know, this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's after she won the final. Um, I think it was, you know, disbelief for her. Uh -huh. uh, a good I told you so moment for me. <laughs> um, that's a, so sweet. But, you know, 24-year-old girl. A lot of people actually think we're the same age. You know, I'm like the only African-American coach on the pro tour. Um, I told you. You but also, it. like, people talk to me and they're like, oh, they're talking to me like I'm 27. I'm like, I'm 40. I'm, like, way older than you, right? So <laughs> initially when I started coaching Sloan, they thought I was her boyfriend, number one. Mm -hmm. And then after we killed that spell, uh, mm -hmm. they thought I was her um, brother, number two. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we've over the years, we've just sort of, like, now I think after six years, people know, okay, that's the coach. But, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, she and I do have, like, a, a very – versatile relationship uh and i think i'm 40 but i'm still young enough to sort of relate to the 24 yeah. 25 year old so absolutely that, that was just like the you know you did it kid kind of moment <laughs> nice yeah and that's you is and is that the new that's look, the old facility that's the old one right that's where i've been yeah yeah that's yeah. the old one yeah yeah well you know we continue to wish um not only excess tennis, um, continued success. Um, is there one tip that you would give for any entrepreneur that is in the sports industry, whether a former player or that decides to create something, what would you say? Um, I would say to just start, right? A lot of times, you know, as entrepreneurs, we say, well, I'm gonna, I need this and I need that, right? And if you can't start on the big scale, start on the small scale. Right. So I started giving lessons in Dunbar Park, right, to just a few kids. And then, you know, they had some success and would justify the need for an indoor facility and a year round opportunity. And then, you know, especially as a black entrepreneur, you know, you have to always overprove yourself. So, you know, I proved from 2008 to 2015 that you can sell tennis lessons to black people on the south side for a below market rate. Right. Um, and so, you know, we had seven or eight years of positive revenue and then at that point i go to the city to say hey i know it sounds crazy right in 2014 you know this idea right it sounds yeah. crazy to sell below market rate lessons to um to you know poor black people right and then in 2017 where now there's all four uh, three of the four semifinalists in the u.s open that year were african-american right and so it's kind of like a I told you so kind of moment, right? Uh, as a matter of fact, the first phone call I met uh, that I received 
was from uh, the former mayor, Rahm Emanuel. Well, you know what? I got to tell you, I did put a request in for a jump in to surprise you. I didn't, it might be too late, but I didn't get a response. <laughs> uh, um, but yeah, you know, and he was like, oh, wow. I was like, I told you so. You yeah. know what I mean? So, I, you know, but even now, and even now you see Coco Golf and a lot of other young African-American tennis players coming. But in 2014, I knew about all those young 12 year olds that was coming, right? And so I was like, yes, we should build this. Yes, this will be a national hub for black people who are in New York and can't afford the John McEnroe Academy, right? Or in Bradenton, Florida and can't afford 75 grand for IMG. Chicago could place could be the place that they run to. And so we've had six families relocate to Chicago just this year from Jersey, Missouri, from Vegas, right? To play there because you know, we're 501c3, we provide scholarships, it's a nurturing environment. Um, and so, you know, I would say just, just start, right? And I also think that Chicago is a tricky city because it's a city where everyone is 50-50 on everyone. I've never met anybody in Chicago that 100% of the people like. Right? Say that again. But, this is deep. Say it. So I would say, you know, Chicago is 50-50 on everybody. You know, 50% of the people like Bob and 50% of the people don't like Bob, right? Or Rahm Emanuel, every decision he made was 50-50. Lori right. Lightfoot, everything, you know? So I think that um, a lot of times you just have to, if you know you're doing the right thing, you just have to keep going, right? And so, you know, I've, I've found that over the years, mm -hmm. um, there is a huge division between the South side and the North side. And, you know, early in the process, there was a lot of, the South side can't support that facility, right? Or I was working a full-time job until January 27th, 2016. Mm -hmm. So I'd already begun raising money to build this facility while working a full-time job. And people say, ah, he's not even committed. He doesn't even teach full-time. He's not committed. You shouldn't donate. You know what I mean? And so I think that, you know, number one, just start. And number two, just to keep going, right? And accept the fact that 50% of the people won't understand your dream, your vision, or the opportunity because they don't live in the space, right? A lot of times entrepreneurs are innovators, right? And they are subject matter experts. Yep. And so when you bring, when you're soliciting funds or investment, you're really talking to people who have no idea or have le less knowledge than you do about the space. And in tennis, I mean, you know, like tennis is like the runt of sports, right? Um, so, you know, it's, it's just keep going, you know, don't let people, you know, discourage you. Um, and you know understand really truly believe that you are the subject matter expert in your field um and then convince them that you're right you know and that there's an opportunity that you see that they may not see um and so you know one of the things i think you know my my greatest sort of the thing i take the most pride in is the work that we do for the kids um but sloan winning the us open and coaching a professional tennis player to me as a black person continues to give me the um the extra edge i need to prove that you know i know what i'm talking about or perhaps you know there's there's something i that that they may not get you know what i mean i think when i was just a guy giving lessons on the south side it was easy to sort of uh, discount the ideas or discount the opportunity and then i think having that success on a global scale created a deeper sense of pride in the kids in the program you know what I mean? It's like, hey, that's our coaches on TV, right? Um, yes. That, you know, very few places on the South and the West Side have a leader who is commentating for Tennis Channel or coaching a top five player in the world. And the pride of these young kids um, who in tennis, Black people do feel inferior. You know, we walk into a very nice club like East Bank Club or Midtown, like, whoa, this place is very nice, right? And so it creates this, even if you do, learn have a you know figure out a way to access tennis the yeah. moment you go to the club outside of your neighborhood you feel inferior and so it's given our kids a sense of pride they don't feel inferior walking to anybody else's club because they go to excess tennis wow so you know you i mean the sense like just the empowerment alone just that just walking into the space and understanding if you don't see yourself that means you're supposed to be there right mm -hmm. being able to empower individuals because I can imagine walking onto the courts or traveling around the world, you might not see each other. So everything that you've just described, really it's like layered 
baked, it's multiple layers in a baked delicious German chocolate cake. (laughs) (laughs) And then, and then when you talk about like credibility, right. In that, yeah, by winning these um, slams or, or championships, then it adds that credibility to the naysayers or the disbelievers. One of the things that excites me so much, and it really shines through in this conversation with you is that with the Center for Creative Entrepreneurship, the vision behind 2112 being a creative incubator of business, meaning anything that you need, whether it's for film, music, I don't know, fashion, you know, there's a fashion lab, there's IP attorneys, there's anything you need, it's there. Um, And the whole goal was with CCE to create this pipeline into the workforce side the back end of the creative industries, because that's where the money is. So to hear you talk about the infrastructure that you've laid out is you're pipelining talent into an industry that historically was definitely not inclusive um, in tennis. And it feels so good, right, to see BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, people of color and historically marginalized communities showing up on the courts and winning and talking to each other, right? And supporting one another. So my heart is full. Thank you for taking this time. I think we went over our 10 minutes that I asked for. So coach, thank you so much. It means the most to us and our creative entrepreneurs who are taking in time to to watch and, and invest in themselves. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Wow, you guys, you know, so unless we have these conversations, it's hard for us to ultimately know the depths of which someone takes a vision. That's one person had a vision and executed it, no matter what other people said, got the funding to do it, and now serves not only a local greater Chicago community, but serves tennis globally and is attracting individuals here to Chicago. So that's huge. Thank you to Kamal Murray. So now let's talk to Jason McKee. Jason McKee is a Florida native. Yeah, we could go all the way back to when he attended Gulf Breeze High School and was a student in the football and weightlifting. I mean, but but this is the thing. McKee then accepted a full football scholarship to Temple University and was a two-time team captain at Temple, where he also earned athletic director's academic lists of honors. McKee spent nine years playing in the NFL and seven were with the Chicago Bulls as their starting fullback. He won an NFC championship with the Bears in 2006 and played in the Super Bowl against the Indianapolis Colts. In 2015, McKee founded All Pro Sports Performance, where he helped to train over 200 top tier athletes, including NFL, CFL, and Division I collegiate athletes. You guys, listen, I got to read this because it's deep. McKee is now the head coach for Central Catholic High School in McLean, Illinois. McKee has also been active in the community throughout his NFL career. In 2008, McKee launched the Jason McKee Foundation of the Institute for Science and Health, which focuses on programs in the areas of education and wellness with an emphasis on making an impact in the lives of families of soldiers. The foundation provides educational scholarships to children and spouses affected by a loss or severely injured parent or spouse. McKee's father served for 21 years in the Air Force and was in the Pentagon at the time of the September 11 attacks. Jason McKee, welcome. Hey, thanks thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. Thanks for the introduction. (laughs) Absolutely. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Tell everybody like a little bit about who you are. I like individuals to share their origin story because whether it's a young person, a middle-aged person, or someone who's making a shift in their career and they're considering a business, in this case, we're talking the business of sports, it does kind of help individuals to kind of understand who you are and what made you make your decisions. Yeah. uh, You know, growing up, 
a small town military kid. Uh, grew up all over the country um, at a young age. Uh, I've lived in the Philippines. I've lived in California. Lived in England, um, Indiana, and then back to Florida. So at a young age, got to experience a lot of things that a lot of people would never get to experience. You know, traveling overseas with my family. Uh, we moved every three years. And, you know, as a, as a kid, it was tough because, you know, you meet friends and then, you know, you're going to move on and leave those friends that you meet or that community that you get embedded in every three years. So at a young age, I didn't understand it. You know, I actually uh, would resent my father <laughs> a lot when I was younger because, you know, I used to blame him for it and, and not realizing as I got older, you know, that was a part of his occupation. You know, he was he was dedicating himself, you know, uh, serving our country. And me at a young age, not understand it, I would resent my father because I felt like, you know, my parents were doing it on purpose. You know, when I when I felt like I finally belonged to a community, we would move. So, you know, my upbringing was a lot different, um, but it actually helped mold me um, to the person I am to this day. Uh, my father was very, uh, very strict on me uh, growing up, very militant. Uh, I always say he treated me like I was in the military. Uh, growing up, you know, most kids, they, they get like all kind of presents and things like that that they wanted on Christmas. Uh, you know, I would get, you know, stuff like combat boots and and you probably say combat boots. Well, you know, my dad would say, hey, you got those boots so you can wake up at six in the morning to mow the grass. <laughs> so it was uh, it was quite a different upbringing, but uh, it definitely molded me and instilled values that uh, that made me successful, that uh, helped prolong my NFL career. Um, you know, being able to adapt and adjust to a different environments, uh, you know, at a young age really helped me. Uh, be able to adapt to different environments, you know, throughout my NFL career. So, you know, I remember it, when I in college, I remember uh, the first time we went on a, an away game, mm -hmm. and uh, it was the first time some of my teammates had been on an airplane, <laughs> and I'm laughing because I'm like, man, I've been on about a hundred airplanes, you know, and they're all scared and stuff like that. So, it was uh, it was definitely a different upbringing, but I'm truly thankful for it. Uh, truly thankful to my parents to this day, and I think without having you know, that military ups, uh, experience and that upbringing, you know, I wouldn't have been able to achieve uh, my dreams that I wanted to achieve since I was since I was a youth. Wow. Well, you know, we salute your father in his service. And, you. Um, you know, it's a blessing that it reared you into who you are today. Um, so when you say speaking of what your dreams were as a youth, did you want to play football? Yeah, you know, the funny thing is, and I've been talking about my dad and, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about my mom. So yeah. you know, what people don't realize is, you know, my mom is the main reason why I wanted to play football. Um, you know, my family, I come from a basketball family. So uh, my, my uh, second cousin is Aaron McKee, who played 10 years in the NBA for the Philadelphia 76ers. Um, I have a cousin in South Carolina. Uh, named Justin McKee, who played a few years back with that University of South Carolina team that made it to the Elite Eight. Uh, his father, BJ McKee, is uh, the head basketball coach at South Carolina. I think South Carolina State, he also played at University of South Carolina. And, uh, you know, my cousin, who I just mentioned, who played 10 years in NBA, he's actually the head basketball coach at Temple University, which is both of our alma maters. But it goes back to, you know, everybody in my family played basketball. I was a lone wolf that, that went and played football. And it was because of my mom, you know, uh, my mom used to play flag football. And uh, she said, you know, as soon as I could walk, you know, in the middle of a game, she said I would run out there and try to grab the ball or run out there and be a part of a play. And uh, she said from that moment on, you know, she knew I was going to be, you know, destined to be uh, to be special. And, and it was going to be in sports, in particular the game of football, because she said I always somehow would, would find my way onto the football field and interrupt the game. So. Uh, my mom was really the the motivating factor for me playing football. Oh, that's just fantastic. You know, it's so funny. Of all the sports, I played flag football, you know, and, and I, was, I was good at it and I love it. Like I said, oh, I know my sports. <laughs> it's just when we talk about the business of sports, right. <laughs> it's the one out of our nine that I'm not shy about. I'm like, oh, okay. Um, that's so cool. You know, kudos to your mom. That's really pretty fantastic. I mean, you know, that being said, I would say too that, you know, I want to talk about your business, right? And your ability to not only coach, but this foundation that you started, because I would arguably imagine that both with your upbringing and the amount of discipline that it takes to be even become a pro 
ball player across the board, right? All that goes into you maintaining just the physicality for you to become successful, for you to become chosen. How do you believe that impacts your ability as a business person? Yeah, you know, playing any sport at the highest level, at the professional level, I mean, it takes, you got to be different. And, you know, I tell my, I tell a lot of the kids that I coach now and even kids that I train, you know, if, if you want to be, if you want to be average, well, just do what everybody else does. You know, if you want to be great, you got to be different. And if you look at all the successful people in life, everybody's a little bit different. You know, you look at Bill Gates, he's a little bit different. You look at uh, Mark Zuckerberg, he's a little bit different. Um, you know, and in sports, if you want to be, if you want to be great, well, you can't do what everybody else is doing. You got to be different. You got to do more than what's required. So, you know, with me, you know, having played at the professional level and and having sacrificed so much and, and dedicating myself to my craft so much, I think it it thrives me in business because. You know, on a professional level, you know, you fail and fail, but at the same time you fail in order to succeed. And, you know, with business, it's the same thing. It's it's having that same mindset that made you successful in sports that really pushes you and motivates you to be successful in business. Man, you just dropped some serious knowledge. I wrote it down. <laughs> you want to be great, you got to be different. Just as simple as that. Be different, it's man. More than what's required. Definitely. Sometimes it's as simple as that. The other thing that's really valuable too are relationships, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's really wonderful to meet you and to know that that how we even got connected is because of an individual whose son you coach. Definitely. Right. So I try to encourage entrepreneurs and at any level. Um, and you know, look, it's the seat I sit in. I don't know everything, but some of the gifts that I've been gifted or the wisdom that's been imparted to me, I share. And I'm in a position to help share that information if it'll make somebody else's journey a little easier. And that one thing that keeps coming across over our nine nights are the most important aspects of relationship building. Definitely. Um, you know, it's a lot of people say it's it's, you know, it's, it's cliche. It's not what you know. A lot of times it's who you know. And, you know, I've been able to I've been blessed to be in situations to where, you know, I've, I've been able to meet a lot of people. But, you know, it's, it's it goes back to, you know, what Kamal was saying. You know, I was listening to him speak and he was saying, you know, Chicago's 50 50. So you know, either your name is good or your name is bad. And, you know, your reputation is everything. And, and my my family taught me that, you know, at a young age that. You know, your reputation is everything. So if you do good by by people, you know, good will come to you. And I've just been in a position to to come or to cross paths with a lot of great people and have been able to to build those relationships just because of, um, you know, my my name and community and what I've been able to do. And, you know, I've just been fortunate that, you know, on the business side of things, you know, having met a lot of successful people and, and trying to you know learn how they started their businesses and what motivated them on a completely different level than the sports side. You know, it's one, it's one thing to be you know, motivated on the sports side of things. You know, you're waking up early, you're lifting weights, you're going to practice, you're watching film, you're going out there, you're trying to execute at the highest level on Sunday to win games. Yeah. But on the business side of things, you know, these individuals who, are, who have successful businesses, it's the same thing except for they're not lifting weights. You know, they're trying to find uh, creative ways to, to make their business unique so that way it can be successful. You know, that's their, you know, their lifting and their training and stuff like that. So you now I'm always one to listen uh, to learn how other people have been successful and try to take bits and pieces of, of what made them successful and try to mold that into into my work ethic. And, and you know, what made me have a successful playing career uh, and in terms make me have a successful, uh, you know, business career. Yeah, it's really brilliant. And um, I love that not only did you consider your foundation to really encourage, the, you know, the ability and, and um, fostering fitness, right? But that you also brought in the aspect of veterans. Um, talk to us a little bit about that in terms of how it impacts either the children or the spouses of individuals. Yeah, you know, military life is, is different. You know, a lot of people um, just think it impacts, you know, military life just just as it impacts on on just the, the the parents or or the people who's serving, but you know it has an impact on you know the spouses. It has an impact on the kids. And you know, like I said when we first started talking, it's you know you're a young kid. You know, you're six, seven, eight years old. 
uh, moving from place to place. You know, you're, you get embedded in the community. You start liking the school. You meet friends and then you move. Uh, you know, the spouse is, is home by themselves all the time. You know, your father's being deployed or he's going to training and your mom has to, you know, the, the wife or the mother has to take the brunt of all the, uh, you know, all the household, you know, everything. The kids making sure they get up for school and just running the household. So it's a sacrifice on everybody. And, uh, you know, I know it was a sacrifice on my mom, making sure that that me and my sister were doing what we we're supposed to do in school, but also you know, outside of school where my dad was. You know, he had to go out and, and do what he had to do, you know, to make sure he was ready to serve his country. So it definitely has a, an impact on, on the spouses and not just the individual uh, going through it, you know, that military life. But at the same time, it, it is truly a blessing. And I'm, I always say, you know what, you know, I know we celebrate uh, Veterans Day, but, you know, every day is Veterans Day. And I think we should you know, graciously give back and, and make note that, you know, these people are are putting their themselves on the line each and every day for our safety. And we should acknowledge that on a daily basis and not just on a one day basis. Absolutely. I really, that just really touches my heart. And I want to welcome you and your organization, the students, whether the students that you coach at the high school or within your foundation, we'll do a social distancing tour, awesome. um, you know, and maybe when the weather's a little better, we can figure out how to space them out of um, the Center for Creative Entrepreneurship because it's a campus that helps individuals, doesn't matter their age, really expand their consciousness around what's possible when you see it, when you're physically in that space. Um, we sit on 160,000 square feet mm. of a total campus, um, but you know, you have individuals who wanna make beats. There's new technology yeah. that we uh, are partnered with, TunePad and the University of Northwestern, where individuals learn how to code by making this, right? Um, or the fact that they can see how producers do what they do. We just um, received a generous contribution and built a Comcast business startup studio where individuals can come and make mini commercials or um, do interviews in a room that was produced or created for that type of production. So I want to encourage you to um, definitely know that that's an option. Um, and really um, find a way to get your, whether it's, like I said, the students or the adults um, in your uh, foundation um, into the ecosystem. No, I appreciate that. You know, I, that's awesome. You guys are you know, doing great things. You know, you're, you're being a blessing to others. And, you know, that, that's what life's about. And, you know, I keep keep going back to my parents, but that's what they always taught me and my sister. You know, life's not about, it's not always about what you have and, you know, what, this and that and what you have and material things, it's about being a blessing to others. So, you know, that way your legacy lives on. Cause at the end of the day, you know, when you're, when that expiration dates up, you know, people don't remember how much money you had in the bank, what kind of car you drive, what kind of house you had. They remember how you impacted their lives, you know, and, and, they, and your legacy lives on through storytelling. And, you know, I've made that, you know, I've always lived by that. You know, it always hit home when my parents told me that even at a young age, you know, I was able to understand, understand that. So, you know, that's why, I, you know, opened up the gym and and train kids, because, you know, if I can be a blessing to them, if I can give them, you know, especially football kids, the blueprint to, to success and you know, give them goals and tips and, and, and a hardworking mindset on what they need to to do or the mindset they need to be successful. You know, that that's what I that's what I plan on doing. And you know that's what I do through do my training facility. That's what I do through coaching. And that's why I do it. I just want to, you know, help change, you know, young kids and help groom them into young men and you know that that's what coaching is you know coaching is not just coaching it's teaching and yeah. you know you're really a teacher you're a mentor you know some of the kids you're a father figure for um so you got to be all that and you got to be willing to sacrifice to do that and you know for me yes i'm an ultra competitive person you know i want to win every game you know i want my the kids i train to win every game uh but at the same time that's not going to happen but you know i always live by you know a, a great a, a good coach can change a game but a great coach can change a life. And, and that's you know, my staff. Uh, that's what that's what we do um, at our school. You know, we're trying to impact and change kids lives and not just games. I got to write that one down too, coach. <laughs> a great coach can change. Did you say can change a life? Yeah, a good. A good coach can change a game, but a great coach can change a life. And so that's just like, you know, one of one of the kids um, I had the pleasure of training in. You know, I don't take all the credit for all, for these kids' success. A lot of them you know, have natural talent, and they have that that work ethic and that mindset instilled in instilled in them already. But 
if I can be a resource just to enhance that. And I was able, I was fortunate to, uh, enough to train a kid last year who, uh, a basketball kid, um, I was able to, you know, train him in, in his strength and conditioning, help his overall agility to get better. And uh, he got drafted in the second round by the Washington Wizards last year, which was, which was huge for me, just being able to see him go from, you know, being a kid, you know, in college who didn't get a lot of playing time to getting a lot of playing time to being one of the, the, the top players, you know, in the SEC. He, he went to the University of Tennessee and to, uh, you know, for him to to invite me to a draft party and to be right there with him when he got drafted and you know, for him to come over and hug me and say, thank you, coach. I really appreciate everything. And you know, you're one of the resources that made this possible. Uh, you know, that's like me, you know, being drafted all over again. And, you know, we've been able to have several stories like that. Um, you know, I had another kid who I had an opportunity to train who's actually from Chicago, uh, played at the University of Notre Dame, played running back. And, you know, he was going into the, into the draft and they were going to change him to fullback. And, you know, he came to me and I was able to train him. And, and through training him, you know, we got close. So now he's more of a he's not a client no more. He's a little brother. So he calls me if he you know needs advice, mentorship. But, you know, he's a kid who was an undrafted kid um, who was able to play in the NFL for four years and fulfill his dream. And you know, I was able to be a resource for that. So, you know, stories like that, when, when you have kids like that who who you see, um, you know, from day one, you see their growth over time and you see them accomplish their lifelong dream. You know, it's like me doing it all over again. So, you know, it's tr that's what I mean by being a blessing. It, it's truly a blessing to see, you know, those stories come about. And it's and it's not just kids in sports. You know, we've had kids that have gone from, you know, having a D, have gone, gone from having a D to being on an honor roll. You know, yeah. just from us being able to talk to these kids and mentor kids and the parents saying, hey, you know, Coach McKee, can you talk to such and such about his grades and stuff like that? Yeah. And, you know, me being able to reiterate the importance of academics, you know, not just athletics and, and seeing those kids, you know, turn their ag academic lives uh, around and, you know, end up being on the dean's list or the honor roll. I mean, those are all success stories. And, and those are all just, you know, just part of being a blessing and just being a resource to our kids. Because at the end of the day, you know, we all know these kids are, you know, these kids can lead our country one day. That's and, right. You're and right. it's very important. So absolutely. So tell everybody where you can be seen. Cause I think, did you say you were doing one of the shows something? <laughs> oh yeah. I'll, I'll be on a, I'll be doing a post game show for the bears on CBS uh, this Sunday. So uh, they're playing the Texans, man. I hope we can get a win, man. It's uh, you know, they give oh, us a, a Christmas God. present, man. I know yesterday was, was, was a, tra was, was a tragedy. And I, and you know, me being a former bear, I apologize to the bears fans personally. Uh, it only get better, you know, I hope, but, you know, I feel for them guys. Yeah. You know, they don't go out there and, uh, although, I mean, it looked like they did yesterday, but I'm saying they don't go out there and try to lose, you know, they work real hard and yeah. you know, I'm hoping they can, uh, salvage the season somewhat and give us a win for Christmas. <laughs> yeah. Well, Miss Sharon Morgan says such a great motivator. I'll bet his students hang in on every word. <laughs> Discipline is the key to any success. You're a blessing to all of the young men for the, that you coach. And, and I echo that. Thank you so much, Ms. Sharon Morgan. So thank you, Jason McKee, for the brilliance of you, the genius in who you are, and being able to share your gifts with our, I would say, not just your community, but now we see that those individuals go out into the world and do big things. So thank you for continuing to be that spotlight in their life. It has been my pleasure to spotlight you this evening. Thank you to all of our guests um, for taking a moment in their busy schedules like Jason and thank your wife, your kids. Uh, I'm they sure- it happen. They make it happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We my gotta... wife did the setup, so you see everything behind me. My wife. Oh, it's. She fat. did all the decorating. She got the spotlight. She turned into a little studio. So without oh, she did it. without she her, did it. And she she's got the dog in one hand, keeping the dog quiet. She she makes it happen. So I definitely yes. gotta thank my family for for everything. <laughs> well, thank her for us. Thank you, Mrs. McKee. Thank you, Jason. Have a really wonderful week. Again, I like I said, I want to thank all of our contributors this evening for this very valuable conversation. Thank you to starting us off, Jim Corneliuson, for starting us off with the national anthem. Thank you to Kamal Murray for jumping in with us as you travel around the world. We really appreciate you and 
anyone who has an opportunity or desire to play tennis, now you know that you can go down to excess tennis on the south side. It's socially distanced and it's an environment where you can play and stay agile during this winter season. And thank you, Jason McKee, for being such a bright light and shining your gifts and sharing them with your foundation and the students that you coach. I am Sadia Davis, the director for the Center for Creative Entrepreneurship. We are tonight wrapping up day seven of our nine day streamathon. And listen, it's not over yet. We are absolutely encouraging you to go to our Center for Creative Entrepreneurship website and log in and see our Eventbrite, which gives you the schedule of the next several nights. So tomorrow we have culinary. And then <laughs> losing track. It's just been a total whirlwind. And then we have our final night on Wednesday with film and TV. Very exciting. Trust me, it's all worth your time to take a moment. So it is my joy and pleasure to bring these incredible programs to you to hopefully inspire and motivate your ability to create within the creative economy. We like all foundations at some point need to lean on those individuals who can support us in a financial way. And so that we can continue to bring these programs and boot camps and workshops to you for free. So we ask and encourage if there's anything, any amount is no, doesn't matter how small, it doesn't matter how big, anything that you can reach inside your phone at this point, your credit card and donate, we graciously accept. And we just are so thankful to be able to have launched this foundation during the pandemic, who knew, right? But we continue to do the work and we do it for you. Dina Michelli. Dina Michelli is a drummer, singer from Chicago, Illinois. Her professional journey has taken her from touring with a Grammy Award winning artist to primetime TV. She appeared on P. Diddy's reality show MTV's Making His Band and recently finished five seasons of the Fox Network TV series Empire. As a drummer, singer, Dina has challenged stereotypes and overcome many obstacles. Her goal is to inspire others to conquer what holds them back because the world is a better place when we have the courage to realize our gifts. Go ahead, girl. I've been offending intimidated. I live to fear now I'm delivered. To the waters in the dark, I want to think she stole mine. You can think you can have it to watch you won't win it.
Now. 